Good morning, everyone. So I thought we'd start class with a couple examples of um, trying to determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar. So I just came up with a couple examples. Uh, the first one, we have to come up with the Lewis structure for uh, CH2, Cl2, and then perhaps think about the molecular geometry of the molecule. So for uh, a Lewis structure, we're going to have um, a central uh, carbon atom. And then we'll have the other atoms attached. Doesn't quite matter when I'm doing a Lewis structure. I'm just trying to see the attachment of atoms. If I'm counting electrons, I should have four for carbon, two times one for hydrogen, plus two times seven for the chlorines. That gives me six plus 14 for 20 electrons. If I do electron pairs around the chlorine atoms, then that uses up all of the 20 electrons. I have eight plus eight, and then 18 to 20. And so within this Lewis structure here, um, you might be looking at this thinking, and this is probably fair to think, okay, dipole points this way, dipole points this way, but we should really think about the molecular geometry, especially if we had sketched this Lewis structure. So sometimes we happen to sketch the Lewis structure this way, and then sometimes we outthink ourselves a little bit into thinking, that the molecule would be nonpolar. If we sketch it this way, we might think, oh, our dipoles are canceling, but what, what's really wrong with the structure, or what would be wrong with trying to think that the dipoles cancel within this Lewis structure? The problem would be that this isn't the real geometry of the molecule. The geometry of the molecule isn't 180 degrees for the two chlorines around each other. The molecule should be tetrahedral. So the molecule should have the two chlorines with 109.5 degree bond angles, approximately, and then the hydrogen's also with approximately 109.5 degree bond angles. Maybe an interesting question to think about which of the bond angles is actually a little bit less or more because um, maybe the chlorine bonds are longer, um, so maybe the electron pairs in the bond allow them to get a little closer together, but I'm not entirely sure. But I would expect these bond angles to be pretty close on to 109.5 degrees here. Um, certainly not 180 degrees. And so I have negative charge building up on the side of the molecule with the two chlorine atoms that I don't have the same negative charge on the opposite end of the molecule. Hydrogen versus carbon is a little tricky. Carbon's slightly more electronegative than hydrogen, so you might have some small dipoles pointing towards carbon. We might have a little bit of a positive charge building up on the hydrogens. Probably not a very high partial positive because there's not a big electronegativity difference bigger electronegativity difference for C versus Cl. Um, we might remember N, O, F, and then Cl. Those are the four most electronegative atoms. So if they're paired up with any other atom, they're, it's going to make for a, a fairly electronegative uh, bond. We're going to get some reasonably big partial negative and positive charges. So we should definitely have CH2, Cl2 um, known to be a polar compound. So we just have to be a little careful that if we sketch a Lewis structure or sometimes see a Lewis structure, that we have to think about the three-dimensional shape. So we have to be careful sometimes when we see a structure and think, is that the Lewis structure or is that the molecular geometry? For the examples with the phosphor uh, atom, so these two examples here, um, these are the actual molecular geometries. So when we see these structures here, these are the actual molecular geometries because these look like they should, the square uh, bipyramidal uh, connection because we have five domains about the central phosphorus atom. So here we are being shown the actual geometries of these molecules. And then in one of the cases, we have the two fluorines opposing each other. That's good. Um, so those dipoles would cancel. Um, and then these dipoles, so the chlorines cancel as well. If you imagine having like BCL3 where you have a trigonal plane with three chlorines all with 120 degree bond angle, 120 degree perfect bond angles here, you would expect BF3 or BCL3 to be perfectly nonpolar. So our middle like part of the molecule on the equator is nonpolar. And then the, the fluorine to phosphor to fluorine is also nonpolar. So this entire molecule is nonpolar. So we have a nonpolar molecule for the first example. But then if we just simply move and swap a fluorine and chlorine out for each other, we actually end up with a polar molecule because we now have negative charge building up towards the fluorine, 
and then the partial negative charge opposite this fluorine is just not the exact same partial negative charge. I probably have a slight smaller dipole pointing towards the chlorine because chlorine's not as electronegative, so I probably have less negative charge building up on the chlorines. And so in this geometry here, since our fluorine isn't opposed by another fluorine atom, but instead by a chlorine atom, makes this molecule here be um, perfectly polar, we'd expect it to have a reasonable size dipole moment associated with it. So when we're looking at polarity, it really has to do with the exact same charges being on the exact same ends of the molecule. We can even imagine, um, and there's important molecules that like our chlorofluorohydrocarbons used um, as refrigerants, or sometimes these are previous refrigerants that aren't as heavily used anymore because the breakdown of some of these compounds in the atmosphere were breaking down the ozone layer. But um, the, um, oh, I've forgotten the name of this compound, but this used to be an important refrigerant, this molecule here, where we have two fluorines and two chlorines on a central carbon. And so um, here in this molecule, you again have bigger dipoles pointing towards the fluorine. So you're picking up a bigger negative charge on the fluorines and the chlorine have dipoles, but smaller and partial negative charges that are smaller in magnitude. So the key for polarity is that if we have the ends of the molecule differ in charge, it doesn't matter if one end is slightly negative, the other end's more negative. It doesn't matter if they're both negative, this molecule here is still polar. So if we wanted this molecule to be nonpolar, we'd have to replace the two Fs with CLs or the two CLs with Fs. We need CF4, CCL4, CH4. Those would be examples of perfectly nonpolar compounds, but then you change the charge build up you change the charge on one end compared to the other when you're swapping some of the atoms out within these structures depending on their geometries and so we see um, an example here with a benzene ring two chlorines opposing each other this example here these dipoles perfectly cancel these dipoles are canceling everything's canceling here in fact i think i'm drawing the the carbons the wrong way carbon's more electronegative but the dipoles here are all canceling uh, chlorine's more electronegative, dipoles point this way, dipoles in towards the carbon, those are canceling as well. So this molecule here is perfectly nonpolar. All those dipoles cancel, but then if we just move the chlorine to a different position, then the dipoles aren't canceling. Now I have negative charge building up on the one end of the molecule, not opposed on the opposite end of the molecule. So this molecule here would be polar. So you see some questions that look at geometries of molecules and really just trying to pick up um, do the ends of the molecules differ in charge. A lot of examples on practice, the daily quizzes, you'll see examples when the practice exams go up, also examples in the homework set, et cetera. So you'll see a bunch of examples of this so you can hopefully start to pick up that you really want the molecule to be kind of perfectly symmetrical on all ends with the same atom or in the case of like this phosphor compound where we cleverly put the atoms in the right arrangement the same atom on the equator, same atoms on the axis, then those dipoles cancel. Okay, so let's move into having multiple central atoms. So um, we've done maybe a little bit of Lewis structures with things like acetic acid and some larger type organic molecules can also be put together in a similar way. But if we were to, to sketch or to write the formula for acetic acid, we'd write CH3, COOH, and this was like a structural way to try to tell us that we have a CH3 group, and we have carbon connected to an oxygen, and then another oxygen. Oxygen's not a really good atom to bridge C to O to O, so it wouldn't make a whole lot of sense to try to connect the atoms this way here, um, because we'd be deficient of an octet for this carbon here. We'd have a hard time filling its octet, so that doesn't work here for this carbon. So instead, we put one of the oxygens on the carbon, and another oxygen on the carbon. And this is also kind of looking like carbonate ion as well. So this is kind of um, stemming from maybe what carbonate looks like. And so then if we want to get the electron count right on the oxygen atoms, there's kind of two approaches we can have. One is we could have started maybe this central carbon this way, where we start with single bonds. So if we start with single bonds and then count electrons used, so if we count up all the electrons available, available for um, having carbons, uh, two of them, so that's two times four, we have four hydrogens, and then we have two oxygens. So if we count up the total number of electrons we should be distributing here, 
would be um, 12 plus 12, 24 electrons. And so, so far we've distributed 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 electrons. And so I have, hold on, I think I'm counting wrong, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 electrons. So I have 10 electrons left to distribute. And so that seems like the wrong count. wrong here. Oh, that's the right count. I'm sorry. So we end up distributing our 10 electrons this way here, filling the octets of the um, oxygen atoms. And so the 10 remaining electrons goes lone pairs. We might have actually put the lone pairs on this one because it's not a central atom already. Um, and so that uses all 24 of our electrons. So we're down to zero left over. And so then from here, we're looking at a positive charge, negative charge. Let's make a double bond to reduce the magnitudes of the double charge, uh, reduce the magnitudes of the formal charge down to zero and zero. And then at this point, and also at this Lewis structure here, you can see that all the atoms are neutral in formal charge and all the atoms satisfy the octet rule. Now, something we're gonna see for carbon, we mentioned it back in chapter two, is that carbon likes to form four bonds with other things. And we see that carbon the first carbon has four bonds. The second carbon has four bonds. It has two singles and a double. Um, and so oxygen is going to commonly form examples like water, where it forms two bonds and two lone pairs. So we're going to see oxygen and organic molecules very commonly have two lone pairs of electrons, two bonds, either through a double bond or two singles. And then we'll see for like nitrogen, for like ammonia, we'll commonly see nitrogen form three bonds in a lone pair. And it can do this with you know, two double bonds and a single, a nitrogen to a triple bond. So like N2 has a triple bond and a lone pair. So nitrogen likes to have three bonds and a lone pair. That gives it a, a neutral formal charge as well. So for organic molecules, we can usually piece them together just by thinking of the bonding nature that carbon likes to have four bonds, oxygen two, nitrogen three, um, et cetera. And so then when we're looking at this geometry, I don't have to sketch it in three-dimensional three-dimensionally to kind of get the idea that this carbon here should be tetrahedral. And because the first carbon's tetrahedral, we know the angles about that carbon should be closer to 109.5 degrees. And so, you know, if I wanted to, I could sketch the, the molecule uh, perhaps this way, where I'm sketching my hydrogens here on the CH3 group. I have a carbon um, that's going to be attached to the oxygen with a double bond, and then maybe I have an oxygen for the, the, the next oxygen. And so if I'm thinking about my geometries here, my next carbon has three domains, so it's going to be trigonal planar, it should have 120 degree bond angles. And then the last oxygen here should be tetrahedral because it has four domains, one, two, three, four and closer to 109.5 degree bond angles. I could even predict because of the lone pair repulsions that that bond angle about the oxygen should be a little less than 109.5 degrees. And so I can sort of predict bond angles um, from picturing the three-dimensional shape or considering the three-dimensional shape. I don't always have to sketch the three-dimensional shape to understand tetrahedral 109.5, trigonal planar 120, tetrahedral 109.5. So when I'm shown a Lewis structure, let's say I give you this Lewis structure here and say, what's the bond angle about that carbon? Do you see how it looks 90? Like in the structure, in the Lewis structure, it's 90 degrees. But in the real molecule, it's not 90 degrees. I have to interpret the shape from being tetrahedral, from having four total domains, and that the bond angle should really be 109.5 degrees. So when we show you a structure, a lot of times it's just you have to interpret, is it a Lewis structure or is it the molecular geometry? If it's a Lewis structure, we had no intent to necessarily show the actual geometry. Um, and if it's the molecular geometry, then we should be showing the proper geometry. So let's try to get a Lewis structure for this molecule here, CH2, CH, C, CH. And so we're just connecting carbon to carbon here because hydrogens don't bridge. And the first carbon, we start with two hydrogens. We connect to another carbon that has a hydrogen. I connect to another carbon that doesn't have any hydrogens. And then I connect to another carbon that has one hydrogen. So this is just the connection of CH2 to CH to C to C to H.
And so then how can I cap off the bonding here? Well, I might just use the idea that carbon should have four bonds. So if I put a double bond for the first carbon to the second carbon, that gives um, both of those carbons four total bonds, um, eight total electrons surrounding them. So that's good for carbon, gives it a neutral formal charge, satisfies the octet rule. And then I wouldn't want to put a double, these frickin' lights, what is, this room is possessed. Um, if I put a bond here, that would give this carbon five bonds, right? And that wouldn't be good. So that wouldn't make any sense. And if I can give you guys any advice as you get to OCHEM, never draw five bonds to carbon. It'll make your TA upset and it'll take points off your test. So carbon forms four bonds. And so if I then do a triple bond for the last um, uh, carbon to the next to last carbon, so the C to the CH, if I do a triple bond there, then that gives this carbon eight total electrons surrounding it. It gives this carbon here eight total electrons surrounding it. So by giving carbon four bonds, no lone pairs, we're allowing carbon to have a zero formal charge um, in these molecules. Okay, and so if we just double check that the, um, we have four carbons times four valence electrons each, and then plus one, two, three, four for the hydrogens, I should have uh, 20 electrons distributed, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. So we can like double check the electron count to make sure we distributed the proper count. And so then I can go through the, the, the task of like carbon one versus carbon two versus carbon three, let's say, and come up with the geometry. So for carbon one, we have three domains. So a double bond is one domain. The single bond's a domain. The other single bond's another domain. And the geometry should be trigonal planar. Predicted bond angle should be 120 degrees. The second carbon also has three domains. Should also be trigonal planar. I don't have to sketch them as 120 to know that they should be 120 degree bond angles. And the last carbon has two domains. And then even C4 has two domains about it. So these here are both um, linear. And then 180. So interpreting structure from the Lewis structure can be done. We just have to think about the number of domains. We can even sketch the Lewis structures uh, for those molecules. OK, let's get into some, um, some orbital sort of overlap, um, uh, 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 sort of start, try to understand what's going on in bonding. There's a couple different models. One of them is that um, orbitals are forming from the, the overlapping of atomic orbitals. And so this would just be the idea that two hydrogen atoms have one s orbitals, and the one s orbitals can overlap. And whenever this overlap is on the bond axis, we call that a sigma type bond. So this would be making a sigma bond. Um, I try to think of it as like single type bonding is sigma bonding. Uh, we're going to see the double bonds are often some type of pi bond. So we'll, we'll talk about pi bonding as we uh, continue. So if you then imagine for chlorine, its largest orbital would be a 3p orbital, just thinking of the, the largest orbital. And that orbital would look something like this. And then you can imagine the 1s um, overlapping with the 3p orbital. So you could describe the bonding in a molecule like hydrogen chloride through the 1s 3p overlap. If you had two chlorine atoms, you could understand or maybe consider that that single bond would be due to the overlapping of 3p orbitals. So here's the nuclei of one of the atoms, the nuclei of the other at the center. Um, and then we just get the overlap between the orbitals. And so the, um, um, this bonding, um, the sort of valence bond theory is what this is called. But the theory here would be that orbitals arise, um, bonds arise from the overlapping of atomic orbitals. You can also picture something like H2, breaking it apart. If you break apart hydrogen, you're going to um, have to have energy absorbed by the molecule to, to break the bond. So covalent bonds, when the atoms are brought together, if you have two hydrogens far away, when those atoms close together, they'll reach a happy uh, point. They'll reach their equilibrium bond distance for uh, whatever the size of the two atoms happens to be. Where the bonds are um, uh, most stable, if we push the atoms closer together, the energy goes back up. If we stretch the bond a little bit, it gets, reaches its equilibrium geometry, the most stable point and then energy has to be absorbed in to break the bond. 
So bonds are stable. We have to, energy has to be absorbed to break them. We, we probably remember bond strengths are always positive from chapter uh, five. We also saw that in chapter eight. So then what about molecules that um, don't exactly, or maybe need to, um, maybe we need to do some playing around with its orbitals to see how we get overlap. So for linear molecules, so a molecule here, this is linear because it has two domains, no electron pairs about beryllium. Uh, so if I'm looking at beryllium, it has um, a, a 2s2 configuration, and you might be thinking, how can I get two different um, orbitals to overlap with one atomic orbital? Well, the answer might be, what if we took um, one of the s orbitals of beryllium, so what if we take a 2s of beryllium plus a 2p on beryllium, and allow those orbitals to mix together, and then come up with what we call the sp hybrid orbitals, so hybrid orbitals is an idea that we can maybe uh, consider the mixing of atomic orbitals in a central atom and make new orbitals as a result. Um, I have to tell you this is in some ways fiction, like this doesn't exactly happen, but it does give us a model to try to understand how we could have um, overlapping orbitals. And so if you mix your orbitals this way, there's two total domains so you would imagine for your central beryllium that you'd have one orbital pointing one way and then you'd have the other orbital pointing the opposite direction. And then if you have fluorine with its largest orbital being a 2p, that the 2p orbital of fluorine can overlap then with that orbital of beryllium. So we get our orbital overlap that we're expecting from this theory. And so we take a fluorine atom over here, again, it's 2p can overlap. So we get 2p overlapping with an sp orbital. So we get sp, 2p overlap to make the bonding between beryllium and fluorine. So it would be sp for beryllium overlapping with the 2p of fluorine. And so again, so beryllium has a 2s2 configuration. So here we're just mixing these orbitals together, just one of the, the p orbitals, one of the s's, and then coming up with these sp hybrid orbitals, and each of them having an electron. So we have one electron right here, an electron pairs up with the fluorine to make this bonding orbital. Okay, so what about something like BF3, where we have a different geometry? So for BF3, now where we're trigonal planar, we know this should have 120 degree bond angles. We know this should be trigonal planar. What do we do here? Well, for boron, boron should have a 2s2, 2p1 configuration. But what if we take two of the 2p orbitals of boron and the, the 2s orbital, I'm gonna to wanna to take three atomic orbitals to mix with the three orbitals of F. So I kinda of wanna have, for each atomic orbital or hybrid orbital, I want it to overlap with one orbital of the fluorine. So if I see I have three domains here, then I should have three orbitals that are mixed together. And so I mix the um, 2s, 2p, the other 2p. I'm gonna mix specifically the 2p's that are in the plane of where the fluorines are. If we're keeping track of orbitals, I'm gonna leave behind the orbital sticking straight out of boron. So or boron's gonna leave behind the pz orbital if you're thinking of, of the axis going in as the z axis. Um, but we're gonna mix two of the p orbitals. We're gonna leave the other p orbital behind and not use it at all in this process. It'll just be an empty orbital uh, for boron. And then uh, we're gonna orient these orbitals here in the direction of a trigonal plane. So we end up with our three sp2 orbitals about a central boron atom. So boron's in the center, and then fluorine can overlap with its 2p orbital. So we call this bonding here sp2 instead of sp. So we're taking two p orbitals, so we call this sp2. And then we're gonna overlap with the 2p orbitals of f. So sp2 for boron, and then the 2p orbitals for f giving us our overlap here within this bonding theory. And so the key is we're just taking two of the, the p orbitals to overlap. We do leave a p orbital behind. Boron does have an empty p orbital, would probably make it um, easy for something with electrons to add into that orbital, but that's a different topic for like acid-base chemistry discussions you might see later in Chem 1220. Okay, so for now let's get into tetrahedral, and then we'll circle back to some other molecules that are sp and sp2 that use those orbitals to make pi bonds for double bonding. But let's look at sp3 bonding. So if we have CCl4, this should be, of course, tetrahedral. Tetrahedral has four domains. If I have four domains, I should be mixing four orbitals on carbon. So carbon should be, you know, just an ordinary carbon atom would be 2s2, 
2p2. Well, what if we mix all three of these orbitals together? What if we mix the s and the p's and we come up with the set of sp3 orbitals? And so our sp3 orbitals would mix the s and all three of the p orbitals, and then they can point in the direction of a tetrahedron. Now again, like, I don't know if it needs to be stressed that this is a model, orbitals don't exactly do this. This isn't some geometry class example, right? Like if I take three orbitals this way, there's no mathematical way they're just all of a sudden pointing in the direction of a tetrahedron. But what we're doing is we're trying to say if bonds originate from overlapping of orbitals, and I have 109.5 degree bond angles for this molecule that it truly has, well, why don't I make orbitals that point in 109.5 degree bond angles, and the system I'm going to choose is if I have to have four uh, bonds made with um, chlorine, then I'm gonna sort of take all four orbitals available for carbon. The lights get really excited when you talk about hybrid bonding, apparently. Okay, so we have our central carbon, and then we have the four different sp3 orbitals pointing in the direction of a tetrahedron. So this is the sp3 bonding uh, picture, and then chlorine is, you know, it, its biggest orbital is a 3p, so we'd have sp3, 3p overlap making the bonds between our carbon and chlorine atoms in CCL4. So one of the keys is that if we're in tetrahedral, if we're in sp3 kind of model, that there's no leftover p orbitals. So all the p orbitals for carbon are used. Uh, when I'm in tetrahedral, I don't really have any leftover p orbitals for pi bonding. Um, or for, and you may be wondering, well, what is pi bonding? Leftover p orbitals, like if we're looking at boron on the previous page, it has a leftover p orbital, and that can overlap with another p orbital if one of the other atoms it's attached to also has a leftover p orbital that can overlap to make um, a pi bond. And likewise, if we imagine something like CO2, which is linear, um, and there'll be a picture of this in a minute, but CO2, you can imagine sp orbital one way, sp orbital the other way, well, it has two leftover p orbitals that can make two different pi bonds. So let's look at pi bonding. So if I look at the case of CH2, CH2, and then if I start thinking here that these two carbons here should be sp2, simply because they are trigonal planar. So it's kind of just like seeing trigonal planar tells us they have to be sp2. So the two are just connected together and what that's gonna tell me is that I take two of the three p orbitals to hybridize in this way here about the carbon, so that's my sp2 orbitals, and that'd be left behind with a p orbital. Now, the th three dimensions, I'm gonna use this picture here, that if we imagine the orbitals in the um, direction that are shown, I think it looks like the hydrogens are going into the page and out of the page by the way the molecule's oriented. You see it kinda looks like the hydrogens are going in and out of the page. Well, think about the orbital that wouldn't have been hybridized in that sp2 hybridization. It would be this orbital here. So we'd have this leftover p orbital on both of those carbons that's unhybridized. But then also, if you start thinking about carbon in terms of its electron count, carbon has four valence electrons, and I'd only be putting three of them into the hybrid orbitals. So I'd kind of have an electron available in those two p orbitals that can then overlap. And they can overlap in this type of bonding here that's not symmetrical about the bond axis, it's now symmetrical about the plane of the bond axis. And so if you notice, this is like a planar bond, so that's perhaps why we call this a pi bond. So sigma bond's symmetrical about the bond axis, pi bonding symmetrical about the bond plane. So this is a planar bond, and it's the overlapping of the unhybridized p orbitals that weren't hybridized in the sp2 process. Now this description of bonding is actually really accurate, that, that, that pi bonds can really be understood this way, that it's the p orbitals that aren't picked up in this hybridization process. Like, even if the hybridization is or isn't true, the p orbitals overlapping this way is a proper description of what these bonds really look like in a molecule like C2H4. So where, the way we'd be describing the bonding here is that we'd have, um, for the two carbons, we'd have sp2, sp2 overlap, and that would make a sigma bond, and then we'd have the pi bonding from the, the 2p, 2p planar overlap. 
from the unhybridized p orbitals. So I have a sigma bond and I have a pi bond. So when I look at, and if I just re-sketch a molecule here, that if I'm breaking this down, what I'm kind of thinking is that this double bond here is a sigma bond plus a pi bond. So I have the sp2 overlapping orbital to make one bond, and then this unhybridized p orbital makes the second bond. And so I end up with two bonds here, and then the carbon to hydrogen bonds, these are all sigmas, of course. So some questions will ask, like, how many total sigma, how many total pi does this molecule have? So we have five sigma bonds here, and then one pi. So five sigmas and one pi bond. And the, the trick, or sometimes you move away from this topic, is making sure that we see that a double bond isn't just one pi bond, that the double bond is the pi and also that sigma. So that we have sigma overlap here. So this diagram here is showing the, the um, sp2 orbitals and the unhybridized p set. And then here we're connecting the sigma bonds with the hydrogens. And here we're making that pi bond. So what if we have a molecule like acetylene? Lewis structure would look like this. And then if we want to give each carbon an octet and use the proper number of electrons, we do a triple bond. And so for a triple bond, it makes both of these molecules linear, or both the central atoms linear, which would then make them sp hybridized. So my central carbons, sp orbital 1, sp orbital 2, the other carbon the same. So I have sp, sp overlap for the sigma for the central carbon. And then I can add in the hydrogens to get 1s sp overlap to make the sigmas here. So I make two sigmas with the hydrogen. And then I have unhybridized p orbitals. If you think I'm going to hybridize the p orbital in the bond axis, I'm going to leave behind these p orbitals here. So I leave behind in the hybridization process two p orbitals. So I get pi bond number one, pi bond number two. So I get two pi bonds and acetylene. So look at acetylene here, I'm seeing that this bond here, the triple bond would be a sigma plus two pi. And then I have sigmas over here. So I have a total of three sigma plus two pi for the entire molecule. So pi bonding can be described from the unhybridized p orbitals in the hybridization process. So things that are sp or sp2 can pi bond. Now, they could also be like BEF2 or BF3, where they just don't use the orbital for anything. So it could also just be an empty orbital. OK, so this is showing us here. Our sigma bonds are the bonds symmetrical about the internuclear axis. And then the pi bonds are the bonds that are planar about the bond axis. So our H2 bond, we have a sigma bond. For acetylene, we have the sigma and pi. Nitrogen here, without even sketching like a diagram, without even necessarily thinking, OK, sp, sp maybe for the lone pair in the bond, and then the, the leftover p orbitals, I could be just looking at this like acetylene, that this is going to be a sigma plus two pi's. And so the triple bond there being sigma overlap. The sigma overlap, we could have that as sp, sp. And then the two p orbitals overlapping two ways to make the pi bonds. So kind of a summary so far would be that we have, um, if we have a um, central atom that's linear, so we're just looking at any time we have a 180 degree bond angle, we're linear, we would call it SP hybridization. Anytime we're looking at a central atom, we see three domains, that's going to go SP2. If we have four domains, it's going to go SP3. When we go SP3, this is where we have no pi bonding that's possible. because we don't have any of those leftover p orbitals. Now this slightly gets into, like when we're, um, if we uh, think back to like SO4 2 minus or Lewis structures like this, remember when we had SO4 2 minus, should it have four single bonds and a positive formal charge on sulfur or should we make double bonds to neutralize the formal charge? So you might remember we would have a Lewis structure, possibly it looks something like this. 
or this would actually be the molecular geometry, actually sketching it tetrahedral. So this would be like one of our accepted structures of SO42 minus. We have a two plus formal charge here, minuses all the way around. And then the other one was where we make double bonds. And so once you see this bonding model here and you start thinking, should we make these double bonds? You kind of go, well, wait a minute. If a double bond's a sigma and a pi, where am I getting the pi bond from? Where are my overlapping orbitals? Like what orbital am I using to make these bonds here? And the answer is there's really no orbitals available. It's really not possible to make this type of um, uh, bond picture. So I mean, the, the book I think should just be a little bit more clear that that bonding model just isn't possible for SO42 minus. It's really not possible for molecules to use double bonds to expand tetrahedral molecules past an octet on the central atom. But I mean, you can still sketch the Lewis structure that way. So when we go back to like a Lewis structure, you could possibly minimize formal charges and, and come up with this Lewis structure here. I suppose it's fine to sketch this and the, at the same time say, well, I don't know what orbitals I'm going to use to make those bonds. So, um, so again, the book would say formal charge rules this one, octet rules this one, so two different Lewis structures that you can sketch and write that are uh, supposedly valid. But then when you come up with a bonding model, you're like, well, it really has to be that one. And then when we get into the next topic or a couple slides, we're gonna come back to the nitrate picture. If you start thinking about resonance, there's almost no way to even picture how this thing's gonna resonate those double bonds like there are for real molecules that have resonance. Okay, so before we show a couple things like um, benzene, which we've shown before, nitrate, some of those pictures, let's just go back through um, kind of coming up with Lewis structures again. We've already done these two, I suppose. I don't know if it's something worth even doing again because we looked at those on a previous slide. Um, let's just look at this molecule here for CH3CN. Um, this name is actually acetonitrile, not that you have to know it, but Lewis structure, really simple. Once you kind of start piecing together, wanting to have four bonds on carbon, three bonds on nitrogen, and a lone pair on nitrogen. So I can come up with the structure here almost without even counting electrons. I can count just to make sure I didn't screw up, so it's probably good to double check. So two times four for the carbons, three for the hydrogen, five for nitrogen. That's uh, 16 total. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16 electrons distributed, zero formal charges all the way around. Right, so nitrogen's five minus five, carbon's four minus four, so atoms have octet satisfied. And then um, classify the hybrid orbitals here, so this would be tetrahedral, hence sp3, hence 109.5 degrees, all three of these going hand in hand. This carbon here would be sp hybridized, and then linear, and then 180 degrees. What would you guys say for the um, total sigma and total pi bonds in this molecule? So one, two, three, four, five sigmas, and then two pi. I don't know if it, surely this won't help the picture because this will make the picture hard to see, but you're just picturing two sp orbitals about that carbon. And then you're picturing having a leftover p orbital and then another leftover p orbital. And then if nitrogen does the same, if it has an sp pointing this way, sp pointing this way for the lone pair, and then if it has a p orbital here, we get overlap, and then we get overlap with the other p orbital. So to make our two pi bonds. So I don't think it's too hard to see. I mean, it's hard to see in the picture, uh, but I don't think it's hard to visualize. The, um, so anytime trigonal planars, sp2, linear, sp, tetrahedral, sp3, so those are all just going hand in hand. Now let's look back, we showed this picture in chapter uh, eight when we were looking at resonance to show how resonance actually happens. Uh, so if you're looking at a molecule of nitrate where you're looking at this Lewis structure here, And so the issue here is that if you move this double bond over to here and make this structure here, that you, you would have a p orbital sticking straight up on that oxygen looking like this. If you move the double bond over to here, you'd have a p orbital sticking straight up looking like that. And then likewise, we have 
the p orbital and oxygen overlapping with nitrogen here. So what if these atoms are able to use those orbitals simultaneously? So what if we can have the simultaneous overlapping of all those orbitals to make one orbital? So that's the representation of just one pi bond. And so we have one pi bond stretching across the three atoms, and that's the idea of delocalization. That it's delocalizing across more than one bond. Now there's a question that I, I happen to dislike, and I don't think we tend to see it anymore because I think we got good agreement that a lot of instructors don't like this question. But there's a question in the book that's like, how many electrons are there in the pi system of the molecule? Which I think is such a silly question because to me it's like two, right? Because like two we're going into this one pi bond. So I think it should be two, but the book kind of argues that, well, these two electrons are involved, these two electrons are involved, and then this electron pair here is involved. So the book would say that there's six electrons in this pi system. And the pi system is just the entire system that's involved in this like hybrid bonding process or in this delocalization picture. I don't know why that matters. Like I've never known like why if it's six versus four versus 12, is there some property that depends on the number? Like it's just something that you're counting. I wouldn't worry a whole lot about it, but you might see some problems that get at counting electrons in a pi system. It's just kind of counting all the electrons that are involved in the moving process in the molecule. So, so if you picture all of our different Lewis structures, we'd have these electrons making a double bond, this electron pair moving back over to here, these electrons being involved, and then the ones actively in the double bond. So that's how we come up with six electrons in the pi system of nitrate. If we look back at benzene, we showed something kind of like benzene. We didn't show these pictures yet, but for benzene, you can imagine having the localized bonds here, or you could say, well, what if they all move over to here instead? And we have this structure, and you start thinking, is this an equilibrium back and forth? And it's not, of course. It's just like nitrate, where at all times, the electron pair is delocalized across the entire molecule. And so this one here, we have these electrons to here, these electrons to here, these electrons to here. So that's two, four, six electrons involved in this pi system. So for benzene, we'd have six electrons in the pi system. This one makes a little bit more sense for me to count than the nitrate system because I can kind of see that those electrons are always like in the pi system. The nitrate one's a little confusing because two are kind of like not really in it. So only two are actually in the pi bond. Here, all six are in the pi bonding in the molecule and in the pi system. So a little, maybe a little bit more clear for benzene. But the key for benzene, we'd be saying that all these bond lengths are the same. I'm not going to have a long bond and a short bond in benzene. All the bonds are going to have the same length in terms of the carbon-carbon bonds. So all the CC bonds have the same length. In this type of picture for benzene, you're going to see this more in OCHEM. Like the, so the idea here is that any time you have a vertex in an atom in this sketch here, you have the proper number of hydrogens to make four total bonds around each of the carbons. So having one hydrogen on each of those um, vertex points would allow us to have you know, one, two, three, four total bonds about each of the carbon atoms. Um, so, and then each vertex atom is just carbon. And you'll see this a lot in organic. So anytime you see if you see something that looks like this, may look like a strange representation, like this molecule here is actually just propane. So it's just CH3, CH2, CH3. This will become more common when you get to OCHEM. We don't talk a whole lot about organic molecules here, but just to kind of show why these structures are being shown like a hexagon, if you were wondering why it's kind of peculiar, we're just leaving out the hydrogens, leaving out the carbons to kind of simplify the picture here. Okay, so there's... Um, Kind of one last topic, and, and it's a more complicated bonding model picture, but it's also one that's going to be a little bit more accurate because there's actually something we're going to try to show with oxygen here today that isn't predicted with any of the models that we've seen so far. And so if I take a little side detour before talking about H2 to talk about O2, um, for oxygen, if we're looking at oxygen with any of our bonding models, and if I were to ask, like, are all of these electrons spin paired? 
I think we would say yes within all of our bonding models so far because we'd probably be looking at these two O's, maybe thinking SP2 hybridization. So maybe I'm thinking SP orbital one, SP orbital two. And then why would the electrons not be spin one way, spin the other way? Um, we're gonna hopefully get this demo to work. I've actually never done this one before, but we're gonna see if we can get a demo to work that'll show us um, with our eyes here, um, in addition to a picture that we have, that oxygen is actually paramagnetic, meaning it will be attracted into a magnetic field in a way that you wouldn't predict a molecule with um, perfectly paired electrons to be pulled into a magnetic field. So there's an important property of oxygen that we're missing with um, our bonding models that we've um, um, talked about so far. Even if you think about a Lewis structure, again, usually we think about a lone pair being paired electrons. That's what we call a lone pair. And so um, even with a Lewis structure, we're thinking oxygen should have paired electrons. And we're going to see that it actually doesn't. And so that's what leads us into this topic of molecular orbital theory. So for molecular orbital theory, um, it talks a little bit about the sort of um, the nature of overlapping similar to valence bond theory that the overlapping of orbitals gives us a, a bonding orbital but it also gets into uh, the idea of anti-bonding uh, the idea of anti-bonding would be anytime orbitals constructively interfere there can be a destructive interference possibly that goes up in energy and the good thing for h2 is that hydrogen only has two electrons and so the two electrons go into that stable uh, bonding orbital, and it doesn't have to put any electrons into this like sigma star anti-bonding orbital. So this orbital here is what we call an anti-bonding orbital. I think it's the next slide, but this is going to be why like two helium atoms don't bond together, because two helium atoms, helium has two electrons in each atom. We'd have to put two electrons in a bonding orbital, and then two electrons in an anti-bonding orbital. And so the, the picture here, I think, is actually drawn slightly to scale, where if you imagine this going down by x here, that this goes up by more than, than x. So it goes up by at least x and usually more. So meaning, if you get some stabilization from making a bond, you're going to get even more destabilization from the anti-bonding orbital. So I'm pretty sure helium-2 is on my next slide. Let me, yep. So for helium-2 versus hydrogen, so hydrogen has one electron for each H atom. We bring them together in our bonding orbital. We make a sigma, that same type of sigma bond we are talking about earlier, 1s because it's arising from the 1s overlap of the two hydrogen atoms. So we put two electrons into this orbital here, that's good. No electrons into the anti-bonding orbital. But then for helium, because it has two extra electrons, they have to go into that anti-bonding orbital. And then we end up with no net bond that can be made between um, two heliums. So when we, and I think you can see this is drawn to scale, that this goes down, but this goes up even more. So there's destabilization, more destabilization in the anti-bonding orbital, meaning there's no reason helium would want to do this. So helium would, if it bumps into each other, it's just going to bump right back off because there's no actual bond that can be made between the helium atoms. And so we can define bond order. We've used it in some way when we're looking at like the four-thirds bond and nitrate, but our bond order, is just the net number of electron pairs in the bond. So I can calculate this here by taking 1 half times the bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding electrons. So the number of bonding electrons and then minus the number of anti-bonding electrons. And so for H2, we'd have a half times two bonding minus zero anti-bonding for one for a single bond just as we would expect now the half is just because we're counting electrons here not electron pairs so when we think about single bond being one bond being shared it's single because there's two electrons. So here we're just counting electrons. So bonding electrons minus anti-bonding electrons times a half. So this is go back to pairs. So this just takes us back to electron pairs. So one pair being shared is a single bond. And then in the case of helium, two, in this hypothetical molecule here, we have a half, two minus two, of course, for zero. And so that means there's no bond. So no bond's going to form between two helium atoms. 
which is good because that's a noble gas. It's not supposed to form bonds. And here is a, is a model showing us why it wouldn't form bonds. So we may have had a little bit of an issue with helium-2 within valence bond theory because we may have said, well, it has s orbitals. They can overlap. Why wouldn't it make a bond? Well, here we're seeing it's because of the anti-bonding orbitals. Okay, so it's kind of funny. Like, I've never really wanted to do this demo because the picture shows you the demo. Like, at the best case scenario, we're going to see this in front of our own eyes. And then you're also going to have to trust that I'm really pouring liquid oxygen, which I've um, you know, always have been told is actually explosive. So I don't, I don't know. This will be fun. I don't think it is, but people have always been really concerned that if you leave liquid nitrogen out, it's going to collect oxygen, and oxygen is supposedly explosive. Well, here we're just going to pour it on this magnet and see what happens. But one of the things that you can see here in this picture is that, that this is liquid oxygen, and that the oxygen seems to be sticking into the magnetic field. So maybe the one thing you don't see is that nitrogen shouldn't stick in the magnetic field if it doesn't have this magnetic property. So nitrogen has all of its electrons been paired, and it also is true that if you look at the Lewis structure, hybrid orbital theory, and then MO theory later, will show that all of its electrons should be spin paired. So let's take a look here at what this looks like in front of our eyes. Let me remember how to. Okay. So I'm going to pour liquid nitrogen first over the magnet. And then it shouldn't stick like the oxygen is. So there's no gas like sticking between the magnet. Let me pour some more over. So it just falls between. So the, the, the plumes of the gas are not. So it seems like nitrogen is not magnetic. Now let me see. Uh, supposedly it's liquid oxygen. This is really air, so it should have some oxygen in it. Second, I mean, I can kind of see it maybe better up here than you guys can see it on the back of the camera. Let me try one more. I don't know. Did you guys see it? Okay. It's, it seemed like it lasts shorter than I was expecting. So for a, a split second, you can kind of see the, the oxygen fume uh, sticking in a way that the nitrogen didn't. Okay. okay. So this confirms my hypothesis that the picture is actually better <laughs> than actually seeing it. Other than we can kind of see nitrogen and oxygen look a little bit different. Um, so let's switch back here. Okay, so the hopefully the conclusion here is that oxygen, there's something about oxygen that we're not representing within um, the valence bond picture, within the Lewis picture. And so that's why we're going to want to get into looking at um, why it is and get to a model that can show how and where oxygen has unpaired electrons. So paramagnetism is where we have one or more unpaired electrons. So oxygen ends up having two unpaired electrons. Diamagnetic molecules have all their electrons been paired. Nitrogen will be a molecule that's diamagnetic. And so we'll look at molecular orbital theory uh, on Monday to try to understand this property of oxygen and then understand some properties of other molecules. And then from there, we'll be reviewing um, chapters seven through nine ahead of uh, next, not next Monday, the following Monday's uh, exam. So we have review days scheduled next Wednesday and Monday in class. So we should get a good amount of review before midterm three. All right, guys, have a great weekend.